Okay, welcome back. I guess you finished the practicals uh, really quickly. So that's good. That's what we expect of you. So, yeah, what I'm going to talk about is how do you handle your data? Some of you may never have worked with human data. For others, this is all stuff they do every day. But we need to get a common ground on that. So, uh, what I will discuss is uh, a quick overview, really briefly, of the workflow that you have in, uh, well, omics epidemiology. Then I'm going to talk about data stewardship, um, why it's necessary and a bit of how you do it. Some ethics and, uh, well, very briefly, uh, uh, I will tell you something about the data sets that we have available. So, the introduction. So, that's about me. So, I'm Dutch, for those of you who didn't know yet. I did my PhD in uh, experimental atomic physics back in uh, 2008 in uh, Utrecht. Um, after that, I worked for six months in Africa. I taught uh, some physics there. Uh, in Rwanda, which is really like in central Africa, a tiny country. A bit like the Netherlands, highly populated, very densely populated. Um, but not as flat, not at all. After that, when I came back, I worked uh, as a Unix consultant at a small company in the Netherlands, which was really much fun, which I, and I learned a lot. But, yeah, science was pulling me, like, this is also something that I wanted to continue. So, back in 2010, there was this uh, job advertisement from the Erasmus Medical Center for a scientific programmer and a postdoc and I think something else even. So I thought, okay, programming, I can do that. So that's what I did, I applied. And then I got the call from this guy called Yuri Alchenko who said, so you can, yeah, do this, you can do that. I said, yeah, I can do it. Do you mind if you have to run around to a server with a broken hard drive? I said, no, I don't. That's what I did as a consultant also. All right, so I visited him, we talked some more and I, I got hired and then Cornelia van Duin, the professor uh, of genetic epidemiology in that group, asked me, do you want to be a postdoc? And I said, well, yeah, but what do I know of genetic epidemiology? Nothing. And then she said, well, we can fix that. We have summer programs, other courses, so uh, if you can do that and be the data manager and be the system administrator of our servers, then, uh, yeah, we can hire you. So that's what I did, and it was totally new. It was a completely new world, but it was fun. And then uh, Yuri left, started his own company. And last year he uh, asked me if I uh, wanted to work with him again. Or as Cornelia said, when I left, we had a dinner and she said, okay, so you came to Erasmus to work with Yuri. And now actually after four years, you're going to work with Yuri. So, and that's what I uh, have been doing for the past uh, few months. It used to be called Yuria Consulting. Now we are in the transition period. We want to call our company Polyomica because that's what we do, many omics. And yeah, that's uh, it about me. What, uh, what will I tell you in this, these two weeks? It's all in the first week, unless you think of something you want to know from me and I can schedule another lecture maybe. Today is this data handling and analysis part. Then tomorrow and Tuesday we will discuss Linux, so how to work with a remote server. Um, it will be a very brief introduction, but you will need it. And if you do any kind of omics analysis, I am sure that you will need these skills. And then Wednesday it will be about reproducible research, which is one of the things that I think is very, very important and maybe overlooked uh, too much. So in short, this is about how to work with data and not necessarily omics data, any data. So a general workflow. So if you're doing epidemiology, um, well, maybe not classical, but even then, you start with a study design. Uh, you will do some data collection, quality control of the data. You analyze it, you meta-analyze it. And each of these steps can lead to feedback to any of the other steps. And you can, in principle, be involved anywhere. So part of the concept of this school is that you know what happens at any stage in this whole process. So 
study design. Um, back in Rotterdam, we have a master in genetic epidemiology. And there, one of the first courses is study design. And most of you as PhD students will not have to design a study, luckily. But once you grow uh, further in your academic career, you may have to apply for grants. And you may have these brilliant ideas about if we go to a certain location, like we saw this morning in Korchilorvis, or what Yuri showed uh, yesterday, this huge pedigree of this little village in the south of the Netherlands. You can think, what, why do I go there? Do they have something interesting? Or actually, you usually think or see that they have something interesting, so you start applying for money to go there. You need to think about what you will collect and from which people, so inclusion, exclusion criteria. And for how long do you do a single measurement? Will you do follow-up measurements? And usually that's what more senior staff does. But maybe you're asked to help with that. Data collection, that's something, well, Osran discussed this morning as well. You saw how it works. And it can be a mix of biologists, technicians, medical doctors, the data manager, and you. We have students, or in Rotterdam we had students where uh, we asked them, okay, we have this population in the south of, Neder of the Netherlands. We want more information, so we're going to send them a questionnaire. And then it's one of the PhD students who prepares all the questions, and we double check and we discuss what we want to know. But you will be, or you, know, you can be part of something like that. And then after some time, you have all this data that has come in, and what's the next step? Quality control. Not only removal of outliers and the crazy uh, values, but also checking the validity. So one of the things we saw when we got these questionnaires back is that some people, I mean, every participant gets a unique ID. And we know who they are, we know their name and address, that's fine. And then it turns out that in one family, they switched the papers. So we found out actually only because one was male and the other was female, and there was supposed to be the other way around. But otherwise, we would have had the wrong phenotype data. So you have a lot of these kind of checks that you really have to go over. And ideally, if you design a questionnaire, you also put some kind of a control questions here and there. So if they say, something that they whatever like it a lot in one question and then 10 questions later they have a similar slightly different question and they say they hate it you already have a problem with your consistency but at least then you know that that data point may not be really really trustworthy the same goes for example for um, uh, let's say lipid levels if you measure somebody's lipid levels if i do that i get a number and i see okay that's nice write it down done but I'm not a medical doctor. So if it turns out that if I get, if I even don't do the measurement, but I just get a file with the raw results, and then I would put that in a file, work with it, and be happy. But then a medical doctor comes along and says, but this person with such a high, uh, whatever, LDL or HDL level should be dead. Ah, okay, who am I to know? So in that case, whenever you do quality control, you need to have knowledge of that data. So. If you ever get asked to do quality control, ask yourself, do I know enough to actually be able to do that? Because it's very easy. I mean, if you, have, if you want to do a GWAS on 100 phenotypes, if you know a bit of scripting on a server, you can do that in uh, a few days, prepare everything. But if you don't check your input data, and if you don't know what is reasonable and what is not reasonable, you get crappy outcome. So usually this is done by a little bit more experienced researchers, postdocs, the data manager, but we have had uh, PhD students do that as well. For example, checking if all the males are males and all the females are females. And then that's the actual thing most people want to do, analysis. Use the data for research, finding out how the world works. And that's done by everybody because that's what everybody wants to do when, you, when they sign up for science. And then maybe a bit extra in the field of, well, genetic epidemiology or omics epidemiology is meta-analysis. As you saw in the slides of Osran this morning, he had this, this height uh, uh, variance explained graph. And you saw how many samples you needed, like in the hundred thousands there are now for just height. 
There is no single center in the world that has 100,000 samples, I think. Maybe one. So you need to combine different data from diff well, the same, hopefully the same data from different centers. And you will, nobody wants to share all that data because it's expensive to make it and nobody wants to just give it away to somebody else. So you use a statistical technique to combine the individual results of each research center and then hopefully narrow down the va actual value. So you hope to find a significant result like that. But before you can do that, you, make, you have to make sure that everything is harmonized. So if I measure HDL in Europe, I do it usually in millimoles per liter. Or per, yeah, per liter. But I think in the States, it's usually something like milligrams per deciliter. So if you just get a value without a unit, yeah, it could be that the Americans look really weird. But yeah, you have to know. Make sure that if you measure height, you report it with a unit, like centimeters or meters. I mean, that's an easy one to figure out. Usually people know that they are not 204 meters tall. But for other things, be careful. So this is the whole, I, th yeah, I think this is the whole workflow and you can be involved anywhere and you will see these feedback loops like we went back after some analysis to the data collection to ask new questions. Or after you've done analysis you find that maybe you should do your QC a bit better. And this yeah, brings me to this data stewardship. Before I sort of say what it is, I think the best way to think of it is by asking the questions, why? So we generate lots and lots of data in the lab, on computers, and that's this big data, the data tsunami, the data deluge, whatever name they think of it, but it's really a lot and a lot of data. But how do we make sure that the quality is good of that data? How do we make sure that, that whatever we do is reproducible? I mean, you have a PhD student, comes in for uh, four years, in the Netherlands at least, and then after four years he says, I've got my PhD, bye-bye, thank you. And how do you make sure that if after two years the paper is finally published and somebody asks a question or a reviewer or a colleague, you can still go back and check what this person did? And of course, if it's so big, we want to automate all the, uh, yeah, as much as possible. We don't want to type the same thing or click the same thing more than once if we don't have to. And very practically, if it's big data, where do we store it? Where do we archive it? So if it's no longer really used, do we throw it away? Rather not. We usually spend lots and lots of money on it and we may need to go back again for reproducibility. But can we store everything or do we say, okay, if I make, if I do, uh, if I use NGS, so next generation sequencing. I'm going to sequence the whole DNA of a person. Usually there are like several steps involved to go from the raw raw data to something that is a bit more easily usable, easily manageable, filtering, whatever. Do you want to save all the intermediate steps or not? Can you do it? Is it, yeah, how, how expensive are the hard drives? And where do we run the analysis? If some analyses take one week, then do we do them one after another and wait for a couple of months? Or do we buy extra machines to do it on? Or maybe there is a national center for supercomputing where we can go to, they have a big cluster. And who will pay? Because nothing is for free usually, even though it looks like that a lot of the time. And of course, whatever we do, it should be secure and we should be careful of people's privacy. So in short, Data quality, we have to maintain it and ensure it also for the long run because we need it for high quality research. The fact that it's big data just adds extra challenges. Even if you have a small data set, even if you work with a um, yeah, small clinical uh, study or something like that, you still need to be aware of these issues, but this just makes it a bit more complex. You have to store it securely. There are national and international laws and rules about that. Uh, for example, in Germany, privacy laws are really strict compared to the Netherlands. So, yeah, and even compared to the other uh, countries in the world. So that if you work with studies data from Germany, it's very unlikely that they will allow you to put it on your server. 
and who pays for all this. And that may not be something for you right now, but if you become a postdoc, you will have to deal with this. You have to apply for grants. And I have seen it happen that colleagues of mine applied for money to sequence people. And then only when I asked, so did you plan for a server? Did you plan for hard drives? Did you plan for my time? They looked at me with big, big question mark. Yeah, but you're here already. I said, yeah, but who pays me? Uh, the university? No, they don't. Everybody is on grant money nowadays, so that, that means if you write a grant, put in some money. So just to give you a bit of an idea how big big data can be, I've listed a few data sets. So if you do a lipid, a lipidomics GWAS, so you take, you have measurements of 117 lipids, 20 million SNPs in three and a half thousand people, the size of the data alone is 122 gigabytes if you store it in one place, right? As soon as you start maybe doing some QC, so throwing a few things out, but you may want to keep the old copy, it grows and it grows. If you do genetic imputation, so you use the Thousand Genomes Project to basically fill in gaps in uh, genotype measurements, you do that for 30 million SNPs, for three and a half thousand people. That's roughly 500 gigabytes. It can be a terabyte as well. And if you start using next generation sequencing data and you need to align that, so basically if you, current techniques in sequencing are such that you slice the whole genome in tiny pieces, do your sequencing of these tiny pieces and then you need to paste them all together again, align them all to the human reference genome. For 1,000, well, 1,300 people roughly, that is already 7.2 terabytes. So you st and that's just the aligned data, so the raw data can be even bigger. And this is not the only step. There will be more steps of filtering and quality control. So you don't put this on your laptop. So how much compute time does it take to do that? So this GWAS of these 117 lipids takes 10 days to run on a given server that we had in Rotterdam. And if you want to do this 1000 genomes imputation, it took us a week, but not on the server in Rotterdam, on a cluster in the National Computer, uh, Supercomputing Center, and we had several servers doing the work for us. And then still it took a week. And this alignment of the and, yeah, sequencing data took weeks. We, I was part of the Genome of the Netherlands project where we sequenced the DNA of roughly 750 uh, people, mum, dad, and a child, and sometimes twins. And that cost us months to do, really months, distributed over various locations. It's just, uh, it was the first time we did it, so it was a learning exercise as well, but still, this is not something you do very easily, even if you have huge computers. And another thing that's sometimes forgotten is if you need to get data from A to B, which happens also a lot. You can just copy the data, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if I want to copy one terabyte over a, well, relatively fast network, this is not what you have at home, not yet, it will take you about 2.2 hours, theoretically, because there is always somebody else who also wants to go through the same line, you have overhead, this and that, so. We discussed whether it would be possible to transfer the data we use for this summer school from Edinburgh to here, through the network. It would have taken way, way longer than this to actually make that happen. And of course, if you go to other places, to the, uh, the US, there, is, well, there are a few very fast internet cables, but not that many, and you share them with the rest of the world usually. So that's also one of the reasons why uh, university network, specific university or research networks exist just to get all the other people using the internet off of that and use it only for research processes. But then, what do you get? You get a guy who does MRI and he wants to do MRI scans of, I don't know, a thousand people and he needs to transfer that from one location to the other. Well, that's even bigger than what we use in genetics. So. This is usually not something, so we ended up for the data here to just copy it to a hard drive and Athena flew with it and 
It may be, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was Rika, right? <laughs> and it was easier to then copy from that hard drive on the server than to go through a cable. And for those of you who want to apply for grants, this is an idea, gives you an idea of what it costs to, do a, to build a very simple server. Really, nothing, nothing really fancy. So we had 80 terabytes of storage for 13,000 euros, two servers with 16 processors, 128 gigabytes of RAM, 12,000 euros. Of course, we wanted some backup storage, 9,000 euros, and then we still had some older stuff available. So yeah, you need to specify budget for this. And don't just, I mean, it's not only you guys, I mean, it's professors as well. They're all hyped about this new project collaboration with this and that. And then they forget that somebody has to store it all. Or you have a collaboration between Australia and Europe. And how is the data going from one direction to the other? Maybe it makes sense to put it all in one place and then let the researchers log in there instead of having half here and half there. So that was more the, the IT part of things, the storage part, but the security part is also very important. What you see here is a part of an infographic that I found on the web with the security breaches that are known. So of course only the known ones over the past uh, well, few years and how many records, so how many pieces of information were in those data breaches. So you see in purple, or well, maybe you can see it, purple is hacked. So Evernote was hacked and 50 million uh, pieces of information, data records were stolen. Yahoo had 20 million records stolen. Ubisoft, a game developer, unknown. Then the red one is also interesting. It's lost or stolen media. So you have your USB stick, which is left in a car, or you left your external hard drive in the train. NHS, 8.3 million records. Uh, well, what was green? Oh yeah, accidentally published. That's also something that happens very easily. 12.3 million records by Apple. Facebook, 6 million. So you don't really want that. You don't want your study data to end up in this chart. And the chart is huge. I mean, this is, it was only the top. This goes uh, all the way back to, I think, 2007 or so, six. Another set of graphics that I found on the web. Is what are the, how do the breaches occur? Usually, in 42% of the cases, according to this study uh, by IBM, it's misconfigured servers or programs. So applications or systems are just not really, I mean, they're not really securely administered. And that's very easy, especially in academia, because a server, it sounds very easy. I mean, that computer over there can be used as a server. Maybe not for big calculations, but you can put a network cable in it. People can log into it. And if you, don't, if you let somebody do that, who is a PhD student or a master's student, I mean, I did that when I was younger, you connect it to the internet and you think everything is okay. And before you know it, it's actually hacked because you're not a professional in security of computers. And that's why in hospitals, the secure, IT security department always has a very, very strong say of what happens and what happens not with your computers. That's why you're not allowed to install just any software on a machine like that. Another important one is end user error. So that can be anything, but uh, it means us as users, we did something wrong. So how do they occur, these breaches, according to another study? Mostly it's weak or st stolen credentials. So you just have a sucky password, like your name or maybe your birth date. That's 76%. 52% involve, involve some sort of hacking. So that's, I mean, this is something you can easily fix. This is a bit more difficult. And one thing that will grow, I think, is social tactics. Um, social tactics is just a guy coming up to you while you are entering your building and instead of 
using his access card, you hold the door for him and he walks past even though you don't know if he actually works there. Now he's in the building, so then he can walk to your computer. Turns out your computer is not locked uh, and then you can, or he can access your data. And this really happens. Uh, when I was uh, this IT consultant in 2009, the company where I was stationed really had this policy that whenever you left your desk, your computer should be locked. Because, yeah, so many people can walk around. And this was a big IT company who stored data for millions of people. So you didn't want to get anyone in. I mean, there are cleaners. Who scans the cleaners? Nobody really looks at them usually. So if you want to get access to that data, you send in somebody who looks like a cleaner or a technician and nobody really sees it. So be aware of that and lock your computers. Actually, what we did in that company, whenever somebody left his screen or his computer not locked, somebody else would see it and then quickly type an email from that other person's uh, computer, I will bring cake tomorrow. So yeah, that's the way to learn really fast, I can tell you. So well, this, this graph basically show, show the same thing. It's the negligent insiders who are responsible. So people who just, yeah, forget uh, to lock a computer or, yeah, well, so lost and stolen devices end up on second. So in the end, for you, why should you care? Because this is personal data from real people. We saw that this morning with Osran. It's genetic data, and that's something that even people who participate in studies don't always realize. If I give my DNA to, uh, yeah, to analyze by uh, some medical center, whatever comes out directly affects my offspring as well. What they know about me, well, for 50%, my offspring is the same. So if I publish my, if I go and sequence my DNA and I publish it on the web, I mean, you can do that. I also publish half of that of my daughter, in a sense. So if it turns out at some point that now it's not interesting, but at some point that I have a mutation of whatever, and, people, and we realize that as scientists, maybe we will get thrown out of healthcare because we are sure to get whatever disease. I don't think in the Netherlands that is possible now, but I know in the US that there is talk always about can we throw people out of healthcare? or make it really expensive, which is usually the same. And of course, well, as I said, it's bad publicity if data leaks and it may affect other people's willingness to participate. And you can, well, you saw this morning how difficult it can be to recruit people. It costs a lot, sample collections, curation, so QC and storage. So my, uh, yeah, one of my pet things again, the reproducible research. Um, I don't, don't know if you're aware, but recently all over the world and specifically also in Rotterdam, we had a lot of problems with claims of data manipulation. Uh, and recently in Tokyo, a whole institute was basically shut down because there was fraud. And you don't want that on your CV. Or worse, as a PhD student, your professor or other supervisor manipulates some data because he needs to get this grant. And then your name is on that publication too, and it gets re retracted from nature or whatever. And yeah, how do you deal with that as a young student? So whatever you do should be reproducible for yourself, because believe me, whatever you do now, you will redo in six months. Either because you find out that there is a covariate missing in the analysis, or somebody had a crazy idea, but let's try that. Change only one thing, so you do the same thing again, with different parameters maybe. And we all write up our research, either for a paper or for a thesis or both. And then you have to describe what you did. So if you just don't write stuff down, how do you remember? Which, which settings did you use? You will be uh, succeeded by other, other people. They will come after you, your new colleague. They need to know what you did. And your supervisors, uh, one of the things that I have heard people do or professors do is ask their PhD students by the time their thesis is about finished, ask them all the scripts and the data that were used to get to write these papers, to write the thesis. Without that, he would not sign their final uh, thesis uh, okay. And I think that's a good thing 
because yeah, you don't want to have these kind of claims. And of course, journals may uh, come along and you see now more and more data needs to be published on the web. It's a requirement of the journals. We're having quite a lot of trouble right now to convince a reviewer in one of the papers that we work on that yeah, we simply cannot put all the data somewhere on the web and make it available. I mean, that, that's against these privacy laws. So there is this conflict on the one hand of open research and on the other hand of protecting people's privacy. So high quality research means that you know what was measured, how it was measured, what are reasonable values, use units. So kilometer per hour or millimole per, mil per liter, whatever. And use standard data formats and understand them. Uh, what many people do at some point, they, if they come, if they're a bit more on, let's say the bioinformatics side, they invent a new data format. So let's store this data very efficiently in this format. That's possible, but you need to know what the consequences are. For example, if I do sequencing of a, so, so whole genome sequencing of an individual, what I end up with are basically probabilities that a given position as an A, a C, a T, or a G. Usually the measurements are not that good that that probability is 99.99%. It's usually much less. But if I, and I, I can store that in a file format called VCF. Another file for, format is from the Plink tool, but the Plink tool only stores A, C, T, or G. So that means that if you use Plink files, you lost all the information about this uncertainty that may have been in the original data. And if the, all these calls in this, I mean, if all the probabilities are high, sure, I mean, if they're all 0.99 or point, maybe even 0.9, it's okay to go to this format. But otherwise, yeah, always remember all the uncertainties that can build up during a process. I mean, for those of you who work in a real lab, as in the one where you have liquids and stuff like that, there, yeah, you really know that you keep this logbook of what you did, how much, well, you had a protocol, a standard operating procedure, you stick to it and you know what can go wrong. And that's something that I find missing in, yeah, some people just because they never had to deal with these kind of issues. You say it's an A, a C, a T or a G, so I trust you. Okay, it's 100% sure this person has an A there. Well, no, it was measured somewhere. So think about that as well. And well, as I said yesterday also, understand your data, what does it do? Oh, sorry, your software, what does it do? Does it really compute what you think it's computing? And provenance is one of those uh, words which is uh, used a lot in data stewardship. So where did the data come from? One of the things that I've seen happen a lot is that you have this uh, PhD student who works with a data set, the new PhD student comes in, gets a copy of the file and works with that. But you, this new person has no idea what happened with that file, whereas ideally you have a data manager who knows the real data. So whatever this PhD student in between did with it, it may be wrong, it may be right, you don't know. So try to go to the source. And if you don't know what happened to it, what QC was done, or what other things. And another reason to look into data stewardship is, uh, well, eff efficiency. A lot of what you want to do has already been done, really. So don't reinvent the wheel, think, oh, I have this beautiful method to solve this or that. Uh, well, maybe somebody else already used that method. Um, there are some famous examples of that, uh, but I won't go into that too much. Quickly, how do you do data stewardship? Practically, if you log into a Linux server, you use usually SSH, which is a secure protocol. So everything that, is, that you type is encrypted until it reaches the servers and everything that you get back is also encrypted. So that's good. It's a bit like web browsers where you have the HTTPS, the little lock symbol uh, in your browser. For this course, we will use an alternative method to make it even more secure, but I'll discuss that tomorrow. Never ever share accounts or passwords. 
When I was a system administrator in Rotterdam, if I found that out, people using the same account, I would lock them. It's just not okay because whatever you do with your data is your responsibility. You usually sign an agreement that you will do, well, you obey the, the rules basically. And if you give somebody else an access, anything can happen. Ideally, use long and different complicated passwords for whatever you do, a server or a service or a website. Um, and there are programs to do to help you with that. Uh, LastPass is one, KeePassX. That's just a little program. You say this site, this is my username, this is my password. And otherwise, I mean, I've been there. You just get uh, whatever, uh, the same password for all sites or maybe you add 2014-08 at the end or something. If you use a special program for that, it's much easier. You can really, uh, usually these also have an option to create difficult passwords of I don't know how many characters. Are they then safe? Because then they're also like somewhere on the server? Mm, good question, yeah. I think LastPass is indeed, you have to trust the guys where it's stored because it's stored somewhere else. Uh, they say it's secure, but you have to trust them. With uh, these two, uh, that's not the case. It's stored in a file on your computer and you have to have, it's encrypted, but you have to have this, well, one master password that you need to remember. And usually what people use for that is not a password, but a passphrase. So you just type something like, uh, I am a student of the Statistical Summer School 2014. Uh, something really long but still easy to remember. And the longer a password is, the diff more difficult it is to, uh, to crack it. Now the last point is really important, uh, again from my experience. Keep names, so personal names, addresses, postcodes, etc. And the link that, IDs, uh, yeah, that, that connects these things to the study IDs separate and in a safe location. And only if you are the data manager, you should have access to these things. As a PhD student, you should not have access to the private uh, personal details like that. And they should actually not be on a computer that you can access through the internet. They should be in a safe somewhere. So as I said, only store your data on servers or computers at work, not on these kind of devices. And not at all on Dropbox, Google Drive, whatever, because you lose control. If you delete something on Dropbox or, uh, Dropbox or Google, it's not really, really gone. And depending on which company you use, you may give them the right to use or modify the data. And they may stop one day and all of a sudden all your stuff is gone. So usually servers or computers at work are backed up properly and you can trust your data manager to handle that for you. Reproducible research will be for Wednesday. Now this high quality research, always be suspicious about your results. It's so easy to say, I found this and that because you have a very nice signal, but in 90% of the times there is something like, yeah, that went wrong. When I was doing my uh, PhD, 90% of the time, well, 99% of the time when I think I had a signal, turns out that some button wasn't pushed correctly or, there was some noise in the signal or whatever. It's usually never really it. So you should be really critical of the things that you find and try to undermine all your own research. Try to find the holes. What could I have done wrong? So when you write your own software and scripts, uh, test it. Know what you want, what you expect to get out. Uh, and test on a small sample. What I've seen a lot of times happening is that people write a script for some really complicated analysis, but they test it on this huge data set. So each time they change one line or one command, they have to wait for a day for the answer to come out. So please try a small data set, take 100 people and see if it works. Because the basic mistakes when scripting pop up very easily, even on a small sample. And about this efficiency, this don't reinvent, not reinventing the wheel, read papers, talk to people really, and not only the people that are near you, but also from a totally different field. It may give you an insight at some point, like, hey, I can do this more efficiently. We had people, uh, I mean, I've had discussions where people were doing stuff 
which would to, yeah, take them takes them two days to change, I don't know, a certain set of characters in a file. And I can do that in, in maybe 10 minutes. So talk to people. And the same goes for these uh, things where, uh, where you need a medical doctor to understand what is actually being measured. Yeah, don't think you have to reinvent the wheel also when writing a, uh, yeah, some code, some, some, some programming, some scripts. Again, usually somebody else did it and they do it more, well, usually better than you do. And there are lots of places to get answers to common questions. How do I do this? What should be the best way? Can I make a comment about the expect testing or what sure. to expect? I think there is, uh, with PhD students, sometimes it goes the other way as well. So you have an expectation, and you get some weird results, and then you feel, oh, probably I was wrong, and you give up on it. But sometimes, if you really have a, a thing you believe, maybe it's a bug and you're getting bad results. So you, you should yeah. go the other way around as well. You just trust yourself a little bit more. That's, yeah, that's very, very... At least at this level, it's very easy to yeah. dismiss your ideas as, you know... Oh, I was wrong. Yes, yeah. I was wrong. Ah, bad idea. You shouldn't, yeah. Yeah. Software is written by people like us, and we make mistakes. We really do. <laughs> All right, I think I have to hurry up a little bit. So ethics, that's another part which is connected to all this. Uh, there are, well, a bunch of famous examples. Uh, I took these from an NIH uh, course that is online. So I think most people know about the Nazi war crimes, the medical ones. So what happened was uh, basically the, in the concentration camps, all kinds of experiments were done on human subjects. And they were not really willing, but uh, they were forced to do it anyway. So the outcome of that after the Nuremberg trials was uh, the first international code of research ethics, later sort of turned into the United Nations uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And these are two examples from, U from the USA where, yeah, it was something really went wrong, maybe with good intentions, but still looking back, you, sh you can say this shouldn't have been done. So there was this syphilis study in Alabama with 600 African-American men, 400 cases and 200 controls. No informed consent was uh, given. Some procedures, so like spinal taps, were sort of announced as, oh, this is special free treatment for you, so uh, this is actually good for you. And even after they found out that penicillin was, uh, well, a good treatment uh, for syphilis in the 1940s, they continued for several decades as if nothing happened. So this led to, well, things like national policies on how to deal with that, medical ethical committees. Um, another well, well-known case is radiation experiments in the, co oh, that should be Cold War. I mean, there you had several experiments to determine the effects of radiation, right? After the atomic bomb was dropped, uh, or even before, people wanted to know what the effects were, or to just calibrate their instruments they used for the detection of radiation. And most of the studies were okay. There was not too much risk, and there was even informed consent. But still, in some cases, people were not really uh, offered any prospect of benefit. There were, it was sort of given like standard practice, oh, we do this. And, you should trust us, we know what's good for you. So in 1997, the Belmont Report came out with three principles that are really essential for ethical conduct of research with human beings. With three, yeah, the, the three important points are respect for persons, beneficence and justice. So you should treat people as autonomous, autonomous agents. They are responsible for their choices, so you have to give them informed consent. They have to know what you want to do with them and why, and they have to, yeah, have to have the possibility to say, no, I don't want this. And if you have people with diminished autonomy, so let's say children or people with, uh, which are mentally handicapped or people with dementia or prisoners, for example, they should be entitled to additional protection because like this prisoner example, they could think that, oh, if I participate, maybe I get an early release. Well, you should be very clear about that, whether that's going to happen or not. Do no harm, very well known, I think. And, well, maximize possible benefits and minimize possible harms. 
Several years ago, there was a study in Utrecht. I don't even remember what it was about, but it was a clinical trial at the University Medical Hospital. And it was stopped really very early because they found something to be, yeah, really, I think, beneficial to people. So they had to stop it because, yeah, at some point you cannot try to get more data points, uh, even if, well, like this, this uh, Tuskegee uh, study. Once you know that something is a treatment, you can't keep continuing to experiment. And justice is about making sure that everybody gets treated fairly and in the same way when, it, yeah, when you think about the benefits of the research or the burdens. So in practice, that means your inclusion and exclusion criteria. So who do you recruit and is that fair? I mean, and that's not only about uh, whether it's, uh, I don't know, older versus younger people, that can be a thing, but like in America, this, this African Americans versus uh, white people, how do you deal with that? How do you make sure that everything is fairly distributed, the risks and the, bur so the burdens and the benefits? So always make sure that you have informed consent. That is even being asked for by more and more journals nowadays that they want, uh, yeah, we had to dig into our uh, records back in Rotterdam, really go back to the safe where we kept all these drawers with all the consents because we had to show for a given grant application that we had consent of all the people for this specific thing. So one of the things you cannot do is say, I want to, I'm going to ask you for an informed consent to do research. That is way too broad, way too vague. You have to be really specific about the things you can or you want to do. And that's of course always a bit of a trade-off because you don't want to just list maybe very specific things because then later you have to go back to the people if you want to do something new. And there's always a yeah, balance that needs to be struck. How yeah. does it work for biobanks where you have the samples and then the questions come yeah. Well, usually in the informed consent, there is already a, a list of questions. That's why the study design is so important. If you know in advance what you're going to ask, what you're going to measure, then you can put that in the informed consent. And if you want to change something, you have to go through the medical uh, ethical uh, committee again to ask if they still think it falls within what was asked in the informed consent. So that's a, yeah, it's a constant thing. And even this, this is not only for humans, for animals, it's the same thing. We had people working on uh, zebra fish and they had to do a special course to work with the fish, to deal with them. But the first few months, they, they were only allowed to work with the embryos until a certain uh, age. And only after additional courses on how to deal with the fish in an ethical way, were they allowed to let them grow further. And every kind of these things is really regulated and can get a whole department into trouble if people just think, ah, I'm going to do that or this. Or... So what is available for us here uh, on the server is, well, that's what I'm going to talk about. I think uh, Janine has some other data sets which are not on the server. We have data from the Orcades uh, study, which is uh, from Orkney in, in Scotland. And well, it's an uh, isolated population study, one of those, or a bunch of islands in the north. Cortula and Vis were already mentioned, right? We are here, Cortula is there, Vis is there. And this is roughly uh, 70 kilometers, so it's really close. And what we have roughly is 1,000 genomes imputed data, so roughly 30 million SNPs. Glycomics data and a bunch of phenotypes, sex, age, height, body mass index, cholesterol levels, hypertension status, blood pressure, medication related to this. Uh, oh, that should have not been there, but more. And tomorrow I will explain you where you can find that data. And in each of the projects, you will see which parts of that you're going to use. But you will need to sign a confidentiality agreement. Uh, I had hoped to have it ready now so that we could do it now, but we are still negotiating a few details. So uh, that will be done hopefully later today or tomorrow. And then you'll have to sign one or two forms and make sure you read them. So be careful with the data you work with, understand it. Document what you do, talk to people and think about the budget for the servers, data collection, the freezers of Osran when you apply for grants. And that's it. Any questions?
No. Then it's lunchtime. Thanks.